By the late 1990s, Foo Fighters would establish themselves as one of the most popular alternative rock acts on the scene. Having come off the success of their third album, 1999's There's Nothing Left to Lose, it appeared the band had finally found some peace. Their sophomore record, 1997's The Color and the Shape, while a huge success, was a tumultuous period for the group. The recording sessions dragged on, while drummer William Goldsmith would depart the group on bad terms after having his drum parts re-recorded by Grohl without his knowledge. I've done a whole video on this feud, the link is down below. In addition to that, guitarist Pat Smear would leave the band during the tour, only to be replaced by Franz Stahl, an old bandmate of Grohl from his previous group Scream. Foo Fighters spent nearly two years on the road supporting their second album, and when it came time to write their third record, 1999's There's Nothing Left to Lose, Stahl didn't gel with the band and was fired. The band would record their third record as a three-piece and enlist guitarist Chris Shiflett to join them on the tour as their new lead guitarist. Work would begin on Foo Fighters' fourth record as early as August of 2000, with Dave Grohl and drummer Taylor Hawkins coming up with song ideas. The band would spend the remainder of the year and a good chunk of 2001 on the road. By the summer of 2001, the band would hit some rough times though. While on tour in the UK, Hawkins would suffer a near-fatal drug overdose following the band's performance at the V2001 festival. He would spend two weeks in a coma. It would result in the band cancelling the remainder of their European tour dates, and a press release was sent out by the band's management claiming the drummer had, and I quote, apparently overindulged at a party following the festival's performance. Once Hawkins recovered, the band would retreat to his studio in Topanga, California to work on their next album. But from the start, the band wasn't gelling. In 2002, Grohl would admit to Billboard magazine just how tense and unsuccessful those early sessions were, revealing, at the time we were making an album that wasn't working. We'd started in October of 2001. After about three and a half months, I realized it didn't sound familiar. It didn't sound like the band does live. It didn't feel right. With our band, the most important thing is that the songs feel right and the recordings feel good. It's more about feel than anything. We were so focused on production because our intent was to make this big rock record. But your energy tends to wane after three months. Spontaneity and energy have a lot to do with rock, and rock records shouldn't take long to make, he would say. Foo Fighters' fourth album would also be the first time new guitarist Chris Shiflett would be in the studio with the band, and he would reveal in the 2011 documentary Back and Forth, it was bizarre. It was my first record with the band. I'd just show up to the studio every day. I was sort of confused. It's really weird. I'm never really playing on this. And you know, I'd show up at noon every day and I'd just kind of sit here and eat food and drink coffee and then I'd go home. What is this, he would say. Bassist Nate Mandel would reveal in the same documentary just how tense everything was, saying, I'd do something and Dave would listen to it and say like, no, this has got to change and this is not working with the vocals and that's too busy. And I was disagreeing, so I had a shitty attitude, he would say. The band would spend time in several studios between October of 2001 to February of 2002. These sessions alone cost the band over a million dollars in production costs. By February of 2002, the band would submit their finished material to manager John Silva, who wasn't very enthusiastic about what he heard. According to Mendel, Silva would tell the band, well, we could put this out, but I don't know if we'll be able to sell any of them. At this point in time in the record's production, Times like these and the song Low had not yet been written. The album submitted to their manager would be known as the Million Dollar Demos, and the recordings would be scrapped by the band, and they would take a several month break. The time apart would allow Dave Grohl to play drums on Queens of the Stone Age's new record songs for the deaf, as well as tour with the band. In the meantime, Grohl would release a statement to fans updating them on the status of the new record, saying, after four months, three studios, and who knows how many foosball games, we decided to take a break from it. Grohl's time with Queens of the Stone Age also created some resentment amongst his bandmates, who felt like they were left waiting for their leader, especially drummer Taylor Hawkins. By April of 2002, Foo Fighters were going to be performing at Coachella, as was Queens of the Stone Age. Grohl would perform one night with Queens of the Stone Age, while the other night would see him play with Foo Fighters. The Foos would reconvene ahead of Coachella to rehearse, and there was a lot of tension in the room. Grohl was disappointed that Hawkins hadn't seen him play with Queens of the Stone Age, while Taylor was still reeling from his overdose. A fight would erupt between the bandmates, and the pair vowed that Coachella would be their final gig together. But the back and forth documentary outlined how the gig at Coachella went really well, and Hawkins felt that Grohl seemed like a new frontman. Afterwards, Dave and Taylor talked about going back to Dave's home in Virginia and recording some new songs. Grohl would tell Billboard magazine, I had this window after Queens' tour, and I had some ideas for songs, so I invited Taylor back to my house, and in those two weeks, we recorded the whole record. 
We did all the basic tracks in 10 days. Then we called up Nate and Chris and I said, I think we made the record. They came back and put their parts on it and it was done. The initial sessions in late 2001 and early 2002 were done with producer Adam Casper. Nick Raskolunitz produced the sessions at Dave's house in Virginia in the spring of 2002 and it was luck that brought Nick on the project as he would tell Music Radar. I was at the studio to pick up my paycheck and Dave rolled up literally in his tour bus to record a song for the Godzilla soundtrack. The engineer who was supposed to be working that day wasn't there so I said hey I'd be glad to record you Dave which of course was no joke. We got on great, had a lot of laughs and I think he was very pleased with my work. Dave and I kept in touch a couple years after that. I had quit Sound City and was trying to make it as a producer. Times were tough. As luck would have it, I ran into Dave in the parking lot of this rehearsal studio called Mates. The whole thing was so random, but again, right place, right time. Dave was just about to start recording one by one, and he wanted to do it in the basement of his house in Virginia. I guess he was having a hard time finding a guy who would commit to sitting in his basement for four months, but to me, it sounded like heaven. So he asked me if I'd be interested, and I said, whatever you need, Dave. Two weeks later, I'm in his basement in Virginia putting a studio together and we proceeded to make one by one, he would say. Foo Fighters would release one by one on October 22nd, 2002. The first single from the album would be All My Life, which came out six weeks before the record's release, with Grohl telling Kerrang the origins of the song. It went through a few different versions. At first, it was really dissonant and noisy. The middle section sounded like Wipeout. It was just nuts. We recorded the instrumental and I had no idea how I was going to sing it. Again, this was another one that our manager said, that's the song, and we said, really? You think that's the one people will like? The song would end up topping the alternative rock charts and peaked at number three on the mainstream rock charts in addition to winning a Grammy in 2003. The follow-up single Times Like These would be written during those sessions at Dave's house in Virginia, and it was written about the band's three-month hiatus in early 2002. It would peak at number five on the Billboard mainstream rock charts, and give the band one of the most popular songs in their catalog. The album would produce two other singles in Low and Have It All. The video for Low would be banned by MTV because it was deemed too controversial. While Have It All did little on the US charts, it would be the B-side, a cover of the Prince tune Darling Nikki, that made it on the US alternative charts peaking number 15. Prince was never a fan of other artists covering his music, so during his 2007 Super Bowl performance, he covered Foo Fighters' song Best of You. Grohl would look back at the difference between the million dollar demos and the final album saying in the back and forth documentary, we had already spent three months and a million dollars on something we threw away. The difference between All My Life and All My Life was that this one cost a million dollars and sounded like crap, while the one we did in my basement for half an hour became the biggest effing song the band ever had. The million dollar demos would eventually leak online and they're up on YouTube if you guys want to give a listen to them. The album itself would end up peaking at number 3 on the US album charts and sell over a million copies going platinum. That does it for today's video guys, thanks for watching, be sure to like button and subscribe, and we'll see you again on Rock and Roll True Stories, take care.